Welcome back to another video. Now, towards the end of 2023, I started my journey into the world of hardware and IoT hacking, but unfortunately, everything I recorded along the way was lost when my hard drive died on me. So instead of following that journey, I'm going to share my experiences on how I got started, and we'll first look at what's included in the Beginner's Guide to IoT and Hardware Hacking, the course that I'm currently working on, and we'll also catch up with Andrew Bellini, the author of the course, so that we we can gain some expert insights into how to get started and where to go once we're finished. Keeper Security is a vendor that we've used for password and secrets management at TCM for quite some time. What's awesome is that they also do privileged access management and it's a more affordable way than some of the big name vendors, which if you know us, we're all about affordability. It was an easy yes for us when the partnership conversation happened because unlike legacy PAM solutions, Keeper is fast and easy to deploy, agentless and clientless and has no implementation fees. Plus, Keeper is FedRAMP authorized. So if you're looking for a new solution to protect your organization, check out keeper.io forward slash TCM and schedule a quick demo with their awesome team. As always, if you enjoy the video, then don't forget to like and subscribe and let's dive in. So it made sense to start my journey by taking the beginner's guide to IoT and hardware hacking, not just because the course generally provides a good foundation and progression within the topic, but also because this course contains a lot of prerequisite knowledge in things like electrical engineering, something that I literally know nothing about. And if I'd skipped this, I know that it would bite me later on, or at the very least limit my ability to really understand things in the hardware hacking world. So far, I'm about halfway through the course and the main standout thing is that it's very accessible for someone like me who once again has zero knowledge of things like electrical engineering and I don't think I've ever even wired a plug before. I know that one of the wires is the ground and that one probably won't kill me, but I can change light bulbs, so I'm pretty good at that. The next good thing about the course is the non-soldering options and once again this makes it a lot more accessible and I have a soldering iron now and I've learned how to solder things but starting out it was nice to have an option where I didn't need to go down that rabbit hole and finally I really liked the scenarios so you get to do a really cool one where you have a task from the red team and I won't spoil it but it just makes the course that much more fun and engaging. So to get started with the course we do need some equipment though you could learn a lot just from what Watching the course if you don't have the means to get everything that you need, but everything I think altogether cost me about 120 or 130 pounds, which is maybe 160 US dollars. But I do think that there are some flexibility in the options, and I'm pretty sure it could have been even cheaper if I'd looked around a little bit more as well. Now, whilst your equipment is in the post, you can actually start to tackle some of the introductory modules, which cover the theory that you'll need. So there's no need to wait around for deliveries. You can dive straight in and get on with the course. And if you're unsure about the course, then just get started and I'm pretty sure that you won't look back. So next up, I wanted to share some advice and things that I'd learned, but actually, instead of me taking the advice that I got from Andrew and repackaging it and quoting him and sharing that with you, I decided it'd be better for us to jump on a call and I asked him some questions, but also some questions that I'd seen crop up on live stream. So let's jump into a live Q&A with Andrew. All right, so in my courses, uh, I talk a lot about working on the fundamentals and trying to get grips with how technology works. And that makes one, learning hacking quite a lot easier, and two, uh, allows us to go much deeper kind of later on. And I suspect it's the same with IoT and hardware hacking. So my question is, what should I prioritize learning coming into the field with no background? in this area. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with both of those points. And there's something that I try and uh, stress in my course as well. So if you're coming directly into IoT hacking without any hacking experience, then I definitely think it's best to get a good 
grasp of ethical hacking without it being reliant on IoT or hardware hacking. So all the things that you would need to know if you're coming into like web app or even, you know, wanting to do network penetration testing. So the fundamentals of networking, what different services run on different ports, what a reverse shell is, basic things like what's command injection, what's a buffer overflow, all of those core concepts that you would need to know if you're doing like any other type of penetration testing, you should have a really solid grasp of those first. And then if you do already have those and you want to, you know, bridge those skills to IoT and hardware hacking, if you're going to want to go far in hardware hacking and do more complex things, then you're going to want to have a really solid understanding um, of electrical fundamentals and some electrical engineering fundamentals. And the way that I, I describe this, and I think I've heard people talk about this, it's kind of like the argument of, do I need to know how to program or, you know, do coding to do web app pen testing, for example? Um, and the answer is always kind of, it depends. But the one that I've always stuck with and that I heard was like, you know, you don't need to know how to go out and design a web app from scratch from the ground up and code it. But you should be able to look at someone's code that did write one and understand what those various sections of code are doing. And that's the same for uh, hardware, in my opinion, is that you should be able to take a look at a schematic or a circuit and have an idea about what the different parts of that circuit do um, and understand why the designers did things. And so having those strong understanding of how hardware works and electrical engineering fundamentals are going to take you a long way, especially if you want to go further in hardware hacking than just, you know, identifying specific debug ports or things like that. So I now have quite a few different devices that have different ports, pins, cables, connections, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm kind of losing track a little bit of what's what and what devices do and, and how, how they fit into the bigger picture of hardware hacking. Is there a good way to like keep an inventory of what things are and, and what they do and how to utilize them? Yes. So that's kind of like one of the one of the problems of many hardware hackers or IoT hackers or just general tinkers is that your desk will get filled up with cables and stuff and it's hard to keep everything organized. Um, so I, I have a couple methods for that. So the first one is that I am a very meticulous note taker. So I will take very specific notes about my setups and what devices I used, even what cables I used. And I also will take lots of pictures of them as well. Um, and then I'll, so in my digital notes, I personally use OneNote, but whatever app you use, I'll just put those in. And like literally sometimes I actually just draw on those pictures and paint or something like that so that I have a good pictures of my setup. And this is something that's come from like professional career of doing testing on devices, not specifically for security, but just like QA or like testing prototypes and needing to have really good records. Um, so that will help a lot. The second thing I do, and this is kind of like a weird organization strategy, but um, I use lunch trays. Like have you, if you ever like been to a cafeteria or something, you know, those lunch trays that you can get, I'll put like all the stuff I need for a specific project on those lunch trays. And then I actually have like a lunch tray holder you can get them for like bakeries. And if I want to switch between projects or put one away, then I keep everything that I need specific to that project on a lunch tray. So I actually, I can, I can show you. Do you want to see? <laughs> yeah, that's let, me, I'll, let me grab one. I'll show you. Yeah, I can send you a better picture. But like, so if you've been following along with my IoT hacking shorts, like this is actually that smart camera. Um, and I didn't need any of these tools or like sometimes I have multiples of tools. So like if I want to pick this back up again, then I just take this lunch tray out of my, out of like the holder. And I've got a bunch of these with different hardware projects. I work on. So honestly, that's one of the ways that I, that I do this. But also you need good nice. notes. Yeah, I think little things like that as well. So in the course, I didn't have a solder. I've got one coming tomorrow. The way you attach the pins with the using like the twist ties and stuff, that would never have occurred to me. So lunch trays and um, cable ties. Oh, yes. If anyone doesn't want to do soldering also, someone sent me this really cool um, product for header pins where like you, you put them in um, and then they have like this expanding mechanism on them so you just like don't hit them hard but you just like kind of like tap them gently with a hammer and then they expand as well so you don't need to solder them all right so you're going to be at the iot village at defcon this year and i'll be there as well so that should be a lot of fun but can you give us like a bit of a sneak preview as what to expect and, and what's going on at the booth and, and things like this yeah absolutely so there will be a bunch of different folks from tcm to come and just say hi to so not specifically iot related but 
but to just chat with us and say hi and ask us any questions you might have. But also we've got a couple cool things going on. So the first one is actually on one of my lunch trays I've got working right now is we're going to have some smart safes that are there. And the idea will be that if you want to, you can try and hack into those and we'll walk you through how to do it as well, even if you don't know anything about IoT hacking. And then there'll be some prizes inside of the safe once you actually hack inside, either get the pin or remotely open it and then open it up and you'll be able to you know physically get a, a prize, whether that's some swag or a voucher or something like that. Uh, and I'll also be actually speaking at DEF CON as well. So I'll be giving a little talk about getting into IoT hacking as well. So I'm about halfway through the course at the moment. And once I've finished the course and I will I'll take the PJIT, uh, I think, eventually as well. But what resources would you recommend moving on to so that you can uh, also that I can kind of keep learning and building skills? What do you recommend as the next steps? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to have that live workshop. So I would recommend taking that, especially if you're going to take the PJIT. Um, so the live workshop will go over some of the same like skills and techniques that you need to know, but it has its own firmware that I wrote myself uh, for the Raspberry Pi. So I would definitely recommend taking that because you'll get to actually see some firmware that I wrote, which I wrote the firmware for the PJIT. So of course, like when multiple people or when the same person designs multiple things, you'll probably see some um, patterns and you'll also get to see like some actual specific vulnerabilities that are a little bit harder to show in the course because we have like real hardware, obviously. So I've actually like specifically coded vulnerabilities into that firmware. And then outside of that, I would recommend I have a blog post actually on my medium of just like links to resources. I found some of them free, some of them paid. So I would recommend checking out uh, that blog post. If I would just call one out off of it, though, I would say to check out Matt Brown's YouTube channel. He is a YouTube creator that just does IoT and hardware hacking, and he just posts on YouTube. So all of his content's free and it's it's pretty high quality. So I would check that out. So now let's say I've completed the IoT and hardware hacking course. I've done the PJIT. And if I wanted to go and find, I set myself the goal to find a real world vulnerability or like a CVE, kind of what advice would you have for me? I suppose, actually, I'm kind of looking for two people pieces of advice. One is how to maximize my chances of finding a CV, maybe, although maybe that's down to my skill. Is there anything like in terms of your methodology or things that you might or tips that you might give me um, to to help me? I would say to start, I would say go and find devices that you can either get cheaply or free and just start taking them apart and specifically try and figure out how they work. I guess if you want to find a CV fastest, then this is maybe not the best method. But like if you want to actually get good and like learn, go out, get cheap devices, either, you know, people throw them away, buy them on eBay. The camera that I picked to pack in my smart series or smart hacking short series was the cheapest one on Amazon. That's the only reason I picked it up. But just get cheap devices and start taking them apart, reverse engineering them and just try and figure out how they work. So without specific specifically looking for vulnerabilities. Like if it's a camera, figure out what binaries are actually like accessing the camera. How are they processing that information? How are they sending it out over the network, whether that's to a cloud environment or over an app or a web browser, figure out each of those binaries, figure out how those work. Um, and that will go a very long way in, in honing your reverse engineering skills and figuring out how things work. Um, and then to be honest, once I find that you have a strong understanding of how those things work, it becomes a lot easier to kind of pick them apart and look for the bugs in them if you know how they work. If you want to find something fast, though, I would say your best bet would be probably to look for command injection or specific files that are not should not be included in the firmware. Uh, so you could just like try and get as much firmware as you can, whether or not you have the device or not, and start picking through looking for system calls and seeing if you can figure out any way to find command injection. And I recommend those just because they're the easiest. Um, they're probably not the most common, but those are the most easiest things, either command injection or literally just using your Linux enumeration skills to look through for files that shouldn't be there, things that have like keys or endpoints or things that shouldn't be easily accessible via the firmware. Yeah, nice. That makes sense. I think that resonates with what I tell people with code review as well when they're starting is... Um, you measure your success by how much you understand of the code. 
sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's what I've told. Like a lot of people have asked me that same question of like, I'm not sure what to do next. Um, and I always tell them like, if you can just go find a free device. Like I have a whole drawer of them because people were throwing them away or whatever. And I was like, oh, I'll take that router. I'll take that IP camera or whatever. And then you don't have to care if you break it or you brick it or whatever, just take it apart. And yeah, don't you don't necessarily need to go in with the goal of finding a CV. I think that's a tough goal to have it is uh and, and it's better to just yeah understand how everything works but if you want to get a cv you should do some research and check um if the manufacturer has a bug bounty program or like if they have like a security research because you might also run into the issue with some of these devices like they're made under multiple manufacturers from china and you might have a hard time getting in touch with like anyone and that just makes the route a little bit more diff difficult to report things so definitely yeah, something to look look out for if you want a cv is not all places have bug bounty for iot but a lot of them will still have like a responsible disclosure program and like an active security team that you can get in contact with and then you could actually get a cv and another thing you can do is just like look i always recommend this if you're looking at a specific device is go and look for cvs for that device that have already been reported because a will give you an idea of like what the developers have kind of been doing wrong if you especially if you keep seeing ones like i think we go over it in the course but like for that specific device keep seeing command injection and buffer over overflows like over and over again and all the CVs. So it shows you that, but also B, it shows you that like people are able to report and get like a CV reported and like through the their disclosure program and everything. So it'll give you an idea that you probably could too. All right. So finally, what's the best way for people to follow up and keep up to date with your content and, and what's happening in the world of, of Andrew Bellini, <laughs> your favorite social media platform? Yeah. So I'm most active on LinkedIn. Um, but if you do want to see like everything I'm up to, I do have a website that's basically just links to all of my stuff, my GitHub and Medium and things like that. So the website's just andrewbellini.com. Uh, but if you want to like connect with me or reach out, then I'm, I'm pretty much only active really on LinkedIn. And that's it for this video. If you are on the fence about diving into the world of hardware hacking and IoT hacking, then I hope this convinced you to just get started. And of course, if you'd like to see more updates on how I'm getting on with the rest of the course and hopefully eventually taking on the PJIT exam, then let me know down in the comments below. Otherwise, I will catch you next time.